Well, good morning. You can open with me in your Bibles to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12 is where we're going to be at this morning. If I've not met you, my name is Tim Betancourt. I have the privilege of serving as one of our pastors here at Keystone. And again, I'll add my welcome on to John as our lights flicker all around. Uh, Hopefully you can see your Bible this morning. It's great that you're here. I know that God has not made a mistake in putting you here under the sound of his word this morning. So we'll trust that God will do the work through the power of his word. So we are continuing on in our pillar series. We are working through what are the key, be- key or core beliefs of Keystone Bible Church? What defines us as a church family? We press pause on our expositional series in Exodus for these couple weeks. These are, are not side sermons. These are actually incredibly vital sermons. And we started a couple weeks back. Maybe you were here on our mission statement. And let's put that on the screen. And I actually want all of us to say this together, okay? So let's say our mission statement together. We exist to glorify God by making, maturing, and multiplying disciples who are learning to live and love like Jesus. That is why we're here. That is what we are doing as a church. And all of these five pillars we're now studying support that mission. This is how we get our mission done. And today we are going to be on the pillar of uncommon community. And if we focus on our community and we lose our mission, okay, if we're just here for our uncommon community to have lots of friends and enjoy this life, then we are going to be completely off base. We are in grave danger if our community is simply just for us to enjoy. Our community is ultimately meant to support the mission. And God created every single one of us. We are all human beings with the Holy Spirit inside of us. We are made, every single one of us, to crave community. What did God say when he saw Adam in the garden by himself? He said, man was alone and behold, it was not good. So he created Eve. So every single human being in God's image was hardwired by creator God to need community. If you think about it, okay, community is a rallying together of people over a common interest, okay? So whether that's CrossFit, whether that's a book club, whether that's Boy Scouts, whatever this common goal or common interest is, that's what brings a community together. If you think of this word community, it's common unity put together. So there's all sorts of communities with all sorts of goals, but today we're looking at our community with our goal, and it is very different from every other community on this earth. It is truly an uncommon community. So a church community, what should be our unified goal? What should be our main common interest that we are all sitting here together this morning? Right? It should be Jesus, but sadly not every church has the right goal. Some churches are, are ill-equipped to have an uncommon community and their community actually more resembles a common community that you'd find in some other group of people. And, and the easiest way for me to illustrate the difference between a common community and an uncommon community is, is think of two different types of ships, okay? This illustration is not original with me, but think of the difference between a cruise ship and a battleship, okay? Two completely different goals, two completely different experiences if you were on a cruise ship versus on a battleship. Because a cruise ship, why are you there? You are there to enjoy. You are there to consume what this cruise ship can offer you for your own pleasure and your enjoyment. That is why you would get on a cruise ship. And sadly, that's a lot of American churches today. Okay, you come on in and you just come enjoy what we can give you. You come here and soak it in, enjoy the entertainment, enjoy everything that we can offer you. And you can see that on every single aspect of their ministry. They're there to entertain. And yes, they're not going to say, our goal is to entertain you. No, but look at it. Why do they have kids ministry? Why do they have student ministry? Why do they have all every single age group and every single little perfect thing? So you can come in, enjoy it, be entertained by it, and go. That is a cruise ship, and that is not Keystone Bible Church. May it never be Keystone Bible Church. I still vividly remember the day where I was sitting across from a table from other youth pastors. And one was sharing just about how his student ministry works and stuff. And he said his goal, right, his philosophy for their student ministry is this, that every single student that walks through that door, our goal is how can we make them a superhero in their story? I just remember sitting there. I've heard all this talk about God-centered ministry and man-centered ministry, and it was like flashing lights, Are we here so that way you can be the superhero in your story? That you can conquer whatever God wants you to conquer? 
No, we are not here for our glory. We are not here for our story. We are on a battleship for a mission. Why does anyone go on a battleship? Okay, because there is something to conquer. There is something to strive after. You've been given a mission assigned by your superiors. So you're gonna take up your post. You're gonna do your job. And if everyone together does their job, goes after our mission, we're gonna succeed. And that is the imagery I want of Keystone Bible Church. Okay, we've already read our mission. It's not a surprise. Like, okay, what are we trying to do? We know what we're trying to do. We know our mission. So let me tell you up front, if you are here just to consume good preaching, consume a fun kids ministry, this is not the church for you, okay? If you are here to grab your gear, lock up your arms and take on the gates of hell, stay right there because we're gonna get going, okay? That's what Keystone Bible Church is. We are a battleship taking on the gates of hell. And so our community is gonna look really different than a lot of other communities that might claim Christ, but we are a healthy, God-centered church. We are waging wars against the spiritual forces of darkness, okay? We are making, maturing, and multiplying disciples for God's glory. That is our goal, and it's gonna take every single one of us living faithfully on mission where God has placed us around Tampa Bay. No freeloaders, okay? No lone rangers. It's every single one of us because we cannot complete this mission by ourselves. And since we can't do that, we need texts like Romans 12. Romans 12 today is gonna guide us and show us how to live faithfully in an uncommon community. Our big idea this morning is this, that we prioritize relationships within our local church family. And why do we prioritize them? Just so we can have some fun and have a lot of good friends? No, we've already discussed this. We do them because we cannot fulfill the mission of Christ by ourselves. We are too weak. We are too sinful. So we are opened to Romans chapter 12 and the apostle Paul in the book of Romans has just spent the last 11 chapters expounding the gospel. Think about a diamond you hold up to light and as you turn it, you see more sparkles. You see different facets of its beauty. That's what the apostle Paul has been doing, showing different facets of the gospel and how they work in our lives. So now we turn to Romans 12 and he goes from just the explanation, these indicative sentences declaring what the gospel is into applicational imperatives, okay? This is what's true, so this is what you do. So I wanna start this morning in verses one and two. We're gonna, our actual text is three to 13, but we have to get the basis of one and two else we're not gonna live out three through 13. So let's look at one through two as we get started. The apostle Paul says, I appeal to you therefore brothers by the mercies of God to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. If Romans 12, one and two do not, does not describe you, you will not live in uncommon community. If you have not laid your body as a living sacrifice before God saying it's all for you, you will not faithfully live in an uncommon community. If we decide that we wanna to come to God's text and we're not gonna be a living sacrifice, that there's these certain things I'm gonna hold back. We're almost like a naval officer, okay? Who, who goes on to his battleship, gets his assignment and he tells his commanding officer, I, I don't really wanna do that. Like I'll, I'll do that instead, but I, I'm not gonna do that. How long is his naval career going to (laughs) last? Okay, probably days or weeks. We can't do that either. It's not like we come to our, our captain, our general, our Lord and Savior and say, Jesus, I love you, but I can only do this. Like you're going to have to work with me with this part, okay? Uncommon community relies on a total sacrifice of your entire life. So a truly transformed heart that's being transformed by the renewal of our mind will live in uncommon community. And so this morning in verses three to 13, we are gonna see four characteristics of uncommon community. Four characteristics that should describe our uncommon community. And that first one, uncommon community is gonna happen when we hold, hold the right view. Let's look at verses three to five and let's see how we should view ourselves. Because if we're not starting with the right view, the right understanding, we are gonna go way off course. The Apostle Paul says in verse three, for by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. 
For as in one body, we have many members and the members do not all have the same function. So we, though many are one body in Christ and individually members one of another. So an uncommon community only happens when each member, each and every single one of us views ourselves rightly. Pride, if it seeps into our community, will be, put us in grave danger. It will destroy our uncommon community. And notice that here, Paul commands everyone to think with sober judgment. That is the answer to thinking highly. Too often we think that, okay, I don't want to think too highly of myself, so I will just think that I'm terrible. Okay, so those polls of either I'm amazing or I'm terrible, they're both equally sinful. Because who is the focus of those statements? It's you. Okay, if I am overemphasized on, oh, comparing myself, that person's gift, they're doing more for the church than I can do, we get all to this self-absorbed, self-absorbed comparison, it will rob us of our joy. So the answer of being consumed or being intoxicated with thinking about our place, our role, is that actually I'm going to have sound judgment. That's what soberly means here in verse three. It means that I'm going to analyze the eyes carefully what God has gifted me to do, and then I'm going to do it. You see there in verse four, uh, three, it says at the end, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. God has gifted each of us, and our responsibility is not to wonder if we're better than that other person. Our responsibility is to use our gift. Look at Ephesians 4, 7. It's another way Paul says this to the letter in the Ephesians. It might be helpful to you. It says, but grace was given to each one of us, all believers, according to the measure of Christ's gift. Christ has given us very diverse gifts, but they are all for one purpose, and that is to fulfill the mission of, of our church. So we all contribute in really important ways. And if we are more concerned with how we're contributing versus the whole goal of everyone contributing together, we will hurt our community. Look again at verse four, okay? We are strengthened as a community of faith when we are different, okay? If we are all the same exact person, we would be a weak community, right? We have many members, but they don't have all the same function. Brother and sister, God has intentionally limited you. You cannot do everything that is a gift from him so that you would rely on the other people he has placed around you. That is from the Lord that you cannot do everything because you then must rely on God's grace and God's grace has given you your church family. Okay, so that is the first view. And verse five kind of gives us a second view, right? I'm viewing myself soberly, I'm viewing myself rightly. And verse five, I think, stands in the face of a lot of what we see in American Christianity. And I hope you grow to hate some consumeristic, what can I get out of this? Because verse five flips it on its head. Let's look at five again, okay? We, though many, are one body in Christ and individually, so each one of us, are members one of another. That word member right there is literally talking about a body part, right? This is imagery used here. It's used in 1 Corinthians that we are one body and we're all different parts, but we all come together for a unified purpose. And I actually wanna put the NIV on the screen because I think it, it puts it in a lot more common language, okay? So in Christ, we, though many, form one body and each member belongs to all the others, is that your view this morning? That you belong to every single other person here. You are not your own. Is that your view? That is the view of an uncommon community. That I am not for myself. It is not about me. I'm actually solely here for every single other person. And my goal is to encourage them and strengthen them with how God has gifted me. We see a lot of communities in our culture that are all about you. Okay, do you want to get in shape? Do you want to learn this skill? Do you want to get sober? Well, then join this little group of people. And those are not bad groups, all right? I'm not trying to say that at all. But what I am saying is that common communities are all about you, and uncommon community is all about everyone else. How can I be here to love, serve, confront, and encourage, and inspire everybody else? KBC is not about me. That is the difference between a local church that is healthy and God-centered versus a church that is man-centered. And actually, I want you to say that to the person next to you. KBC is not about me, okay? Say it to the person next to you. Okay, let's all say it together, okay? KBC is not about me. If we grasp that, 
We will have the foundation of how we can be a healthy church, that we are here for everyone else. We belong to them and they belong to us. We have to understand this. We have to understand this when we are offended by a brother or sister. We have to understand this when the leadership makes a decision, that's not my preference that I'm not ultimately here for me. I am here for the greater good of God and God is glorified as we live belonging to one another all together for one mission, which is God's glory. So we must all play our part. There are no lone rangers. There are no freeloaders. What are you doing to help accomplish the mission of Keystone Bible Church? How are you serving and loving the other members of Keystone? If your only interaction with Keystone Bible Church is an hour and a half service on Sunday morning, please tell me how you are belonging to this church. I don't have an answer for you, especially if you come in and you leave immediately. You are not belonging to this church. The members are not relying on you and you are not relying on the other members. That's why I prayed that we would submit our hearts to this text because we want our freedom. We want our will. We want to do what we want to do. And God is saying, absolutely not. You want to be in my church? You want to live for my glory? You have to sacrifice all of that. We belong to one another. And how do we live life together as we belong to one another? If you've been at Keystone, you know these four words, right? You know these four phrases. We worship in services. We live in groups. We grow in studies. We serve on teams. And are those just like magical thing? If you do them, then you're automatically going to belong Absolutely not. Your heart has to be in all of those. But these are the rhythms of our life where we can belong to one another, that we're in big groups together. We're in small groups together. We are serving together. We are studying together. So how are you belonging to this church? Do you belong to this church? We must hold the right view. And the right view is that every single member belongs to every other member. Let me illustrate the, the danger of not belonging to a church like this, okay? What would your reaction be if you drive home today after the service, you go to the kitchen sink, you're about to wash your hands and start lunch, and you walk up, you turn the water on, you look down, and there is a completely severed human hand in your sink, okay? Are you just like, all right, no deal, no, no worries, throw that away, keep washing my hands? No, okay? There are a few more disgusting things than a severed human body part, Okay, that means something terribly wrong has happened. Or you're gonna freak out, you're gonna call the police because something bad has happened and the problem needs to get fixed. That's what's going on here. If you are a disconnected body part, something wrong has happened. Something must change. If you are disconnected, something wrong has happened and there needs to be a remedy to that situation. Which wildebeest does a lion go after when he's hunting his prey? The one in the back, kind of lagging behind all the rest. What does First Peter call Satan? A roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. How many of you want God work to work powerfully in your life, but you're actually disconnected from God's, you, God's local church, his main tool for growth in your life? We must live together in uncommon community. I love this quote from Robert Mounts. He says, the Christian faith is essentially a corporate experience. Although each member has come to faith by a separate and individual act of faith, the believing community lives out its Christian experience in fellowship with one another. John Doan's No Man Is an Island is true of the church of Jesus Christ. Lone Ranger Christianity is a contradiction in terms. So brothers and sisters, an uncommon community happens when we rightly view ourselves soberly with sound judgment and we view ourselves as belonging to the people of our community. We must have the right view. And if we have the right view, that's going to transition right to our second characteristic. That if I do understand that I belong to all of you, then I'm going to serve you with my gifts. That is our second characteristic this morning, that an uncommon community will happen when we serve with our gifts. And in verses six through eight, the apostle Paul walks through seven different spiritual gifts and an encouragement on how you should use these gifts. And every human who has been regenerated by the Holy Spirit has been given a spiritual gift. 
Here are some, here in verse uh, six, verses six through eight, you can also see them in 1 Corinthians 12. I don't think any of these lists are, are entirely exhaustive, but they give us a representation of what we should be doing, how we should be serving our local body. So let's work through these. So first off, in verse six, we see having gifts that differ according, again, to this special grace that God has given us that is diverse in all our different people, but let us use them. So this first gift we see is if prophecy in proportion or think of in agreement to our faith. So when Paul is writing this letter, the Bible is not yet fully finished. So there are times when God needs to reveal himself and he needs to reveal himself through the spiritual gift of prophecy where a believer would speak the words of God, almost very incredibly much similar like the Old Testament prophets. Okay, Micah, Nahum, right? They get a message from God and they are simply the mouthpiece of God. They get it and they tell Israel or Judah or whoever needs to hear this prophecy. So that gift is no longer active today, I would argue, because all of scripture is complete. We have everything we need to know from God. So if we're looking for a parallel in our times, who would be the person who would take God's word and herald it out to God's people? Okay, I would argue the contemporary parallel would be the gift of preaching. Okay, the person who preaches, what is the apostle Paul saying here? Okay, you need to do it accurately. If someone stands up here and says, this is what God's word says, that better be what God's word says. It is incredibly important that it is accurate and it faithfully explains, exposits, illustrates, applies what God's word says. So that's our first one of prophecy. Secondly, we see if service in our serving in verse seven and helping, this is really helping another person so that they get the benefit instead of you. And it's kind of sort of a catch-all, but the focus is I want to get the focus off of myself and I want to help some other person. The language we use here at Keystone of serve on teams, that is a good terminology. And at this point, I just want to pause so that we don't understand. It's not like you just have one of these gifts so you don't have to do anything else. Okay, like I have the gift of preaching, so I don't have to serve any of you guys. Okay, I don't have to encourage you. I don't have to give. I don't have to show mercy. That is not at all what's happening. Actually, most of us are called to do most of these things, but some of us are especially equipped, especially strengthened by the Spirit to do these gifts. So earlier this month, I heard someone describe this way. It made me smile. He said, this, this person, he's only ever happy if he's serving someone. Okay, that's that person who is incredibly gifted, where there's just this natural god give desire to continually serve Next, in verse seven, we see the gift of teaching, okay? The one who teaches in his teaching. So this is someone who passes on the truth of the gospel. This is, yes, a a formalized Bible study, a formalized Keystone Kids class that are happening on the other side of the building. But this is also you sitting at a Starbucks across from a brother or sister and then explaining God's word to them, okay? This is using God's word to explain, to encourage, And God uses your explanation through the Holy Spirit to strengthen that person. That is the gift of teaching. It's not only in big formal ways. It's also in informal, small, one-on-one settings. Can you use God's word to help a brother or sister? Can you teach them what it means? So our third gift, our fourth one this morning in verse 8 The one who exhorts in his exhortation. Exhortation is another word for encouragement. Don't we love people who are really good encouragers? They are very much needed as we live together on mission. They do a great job of coming around you, encouraging you, helping you stand up and getting back on towards your goal. They know what to say. They know when to say it. They know, best of all, how to say it. That is a gift from the Lord that we should use. Fifth, in verse eight, we see the gift of giving. So the one who contributes and their generosity, this is someone who shares their resources. Some of you are just especially burdened when there's someone who is going through a difficulty that you wanna give of what you have to bless them. That is a gift from the Lord, from the spirit working inside of you. And you should keep on giving and you should give generously, trusting the Lord to provide for you. Next, our sixth one, the one who leads with zeal. So this is a gift of leadership. And we have formal leaders here, right? We have pastors, we have serve team leaders, but it's not only um, limited to the formal roles of leadership. Some of you, people just follow you. It is easy for you to rally around people with a certain vision 
okay? And that is leadership, whether that's the formal pastors of our church or it's a serve team leader or it's you and your life group or your Bible study, you are rallying around a group of people to serve the Lord and to do something for his glory. If you've used that gift and you are wasting it, that is hurting our church, just like each and every one of these. Lastly, our last one for this gift these gifts in verse eight, our final one, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness, showing mercy to those who have nothing, whether that's someone who's elderly, who is poor, who is sick, for whatever the purpose is, they are in need and you are mercifully helping them. This has a lot to do with giving as well. And we are called to do it cheerfully, not because we have to, but because we want to, we want to use the gift that God has given us for his glory in our church. And so in a sense, again, we are all called to do a majority of those things, but there are some things that God has especially equipped you to do, and you need to major on those. You need to lean into how God has gifted you to glorify himself. And after we walk through a list like that of of those seven, a lot of people are just, they get really introspective. Like, what is my spiritual gift? Like, how has God gifted me? Like the fact you can, you can go online and find like hundreds of spiritual gift quizzes, okay? Maybe you've done one of them before. But let me pass on a word of advice to you that I've been given and I find it very helpful. Don't sit by idly wondering what your gift is. Get involved and God will show it to you. <laughs> You get your towel dirty, God's not gonna like magically hold it back. Like, oh, they're not, they haven't found it yet. Get busy doing what God needs you to do at this church. And there are plenty of things we need to do at this church. Come talk to me if you don't have a way or an outlet to do that. I get plenty to do, okay? And God will reveal his gift to you through your faithful work. Okay, I'm gonna put a Venn diagram on the screen. I really wanna take away the mystery of of spiritual gifts here, okay? So we have three different A's and then together we see your spiritual gift. Okay, this is how you can help find it. So first off, your affinity. What do you have a natural desire for? Okay, then ability. It's not just a desire, but actually like you have some skill in that. And then lastly, affirmation, where other brothers and sisters in Christ affirm you in that skill, affirm you in that gift. So let's use the gift of encouragement, right? You just naturally, you find that when you see someone hurting, there's just this this pulse in your heart that you have to go. And as you go and you have conversations, you find that actually when you, you have that conversation, the person leaves encouraged. Like you see the fruit of your ministry and others begin to see that fruit as well. And they encourage you that you are in fact a very strong encourager. That's how this works, folks. It's not sitting back until God shines this beautiful light on you. Get serving, get involved, and God will show you where you should serve. God will show you how you should serve. So these are the spiritual gifts that God has given us. But church, if you are not using your spiritual gift, then you are hurting our church. Sometimes I think we can mistakenly think that if I have my spiritual gift and God's given it to me, then serving with it is gonna be easy. And I would like to tell you that is absolutely incorrect. Like, oh, you know, that serving, it's not really natural. Like I kind of get up in the morning and I I don't really wanna go in. Serving with your spiritual gift is not gonna be easy. And I actually am gonna tell you as well that it's gonna take sacrifice. You are gonna have to take real life sacrifices to serve with your gift. It is not gonna come easy. It's not gonna come naturally to you. So what happens when you serve? Sometimes you go and you serve and someone is offensive, right? Or or someone doesn't actually thank you. Or actually you get embarrassed because you make a mistake and everybody else sees it. And some of you, that's enough to stop you because you're not actually serving for one another, you're serving for you. I don't wanna stand up here and say, guys, come serve with your gifts. It's gonna be super easy. It's gonna be amazing. It's gonna be worth it. I'm not gonna tell you it's super easy, but I'm gonna tell you it's super worth it. And our church needs it. God will use you serving with your gifts to grow you closer to him. It will grow you through challenges. And listen to me, loved ones, if you are not serving with your spiritual gift, you are hurting our church community. You are hurting us. This is not, oh, I'll get to it when I have a little bit more time. If you are not serving with your gift, you are hurting our church community. So what do we do? Where do we go from here? We get over ourselves, whether that's thinking too highly or thinking too lowly, and we get our towel dirty. 
We go and we serve wherever God needs us, whether we know or are confident or not about what our spiritual gift is. Serving with your gift is not about what you can get out of the experience. Serving is about how you can bless others and ultimately bless God as we belong to one another, this deep bond together. Your brothers and sisters need you to use your gift and to use it well. We are all relying on you because we all belong to you. We need you. Keystone Bible Church has been given a group project by our professor, the Lord of heaven and earth. Okay, and we know what our group project is. It's to glorify God by making, maturing, and multiplying disciples who are learning to live in love like Jesus. Are you that group member who's frustrating all the rest of us because you're just kind of hoping to slide along and get the same group grade with us? Because I hate to tell you, but that's not how it works when you're before Jesus. Okay? You will have to take an account for why you were not involved in your local church community and why you did not serve with your gifts that God gave you. This is incredibly serious that we, distri- we desire, we strive to be an uncommon community. So we have to be filled with those who willingly and joyfully serve with their gifts because we want to see God glorified. We want to see disciples made, matured, and multiplied. And our third characteristic this morning is going to kind of keep building on it, right? Paul's making an argument. So first off, we understand our view, okay? We are soberly understanding our role. We are belonging to one another. We are serving with our gifts. And that service is not disconnected from our emotions or our passions. So our third characteristic of an uncommon community is that we love like family. Look at verse 9. What does Paul command? He says, let love be genuine, Abhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Paul starts these really staccato commands, and it almost might seem that these are kind of like random shotgun blasts, but it it could not be farther from the case, and I'm hoping to help connect these dots. So this first command of let love be genuine is kind of like the overarching goal of all the rest of these, that our goal is to show genuine love. And that's because, guys, love is the foundation of a Christian community. Notice here, Paul is almost assuming that they're loving, so he gives them a specific command about that love. That love must be genuine. It is very easy here to fake love. But notice, he says, let love be genuine. So that is literally meaning without hypocrisy, without um, deception. And I think a lot of us, we intend to be genuine in our love, but we're all guilty of saying that we love you and we, we want to love you. But with our words, with our words, we say one thing, with our actions, we say something else. We live out the truth of 1 John 3.18, or I, we don't, I should say. Then 1 John 3.18 says, let us, little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. So genuine love does not use manipulative tactics to get what it wants. Genuine love looks very specifically, if you continue on in verse 9, genuine love look like, looks like abhorring what is evil and holding fast to what is good. Maybe that sounds a little bit more personal to you. Well, that's what I'm personally doing. But does our sin affect those around us? Yes, absolutely. So if we are genuinely loving our community, we are going to abhor what is evil and we're going to hold fast to what is good. And these verbs could not be stronger in the Greek. Like this is literally, I can't even look at what is evil and I cannot have a whole firmer grasp on what is good. I am literally glued to what is good. That is the imagery on display here. And love is not genuine when it leads a person to do something evil or to lead that person to avoid doing what is right. Our love must be genuine. We must genuinely abhor what is evil and cling to what is good. So what would change in our church community if all of us together did abhor what is evil and if we clung to what is good? What evil are you playing around with in your heart? What fire are you playing with? Because you're going to get burned, and it's going to hurt all of us. The evangelical world was rocked about two weeks ago when the well-known pastor, preacher, and professor, Dr. Stephen Lawson, was removed indefinitely from all his ministry activities, effective immediately because he had an inappropriate relationship with a woman who was not his wife. 
And I am one of the many people that's been hurt by that. I really appreciated his ministry. He had a very powerful preaching ministry online and in person as well. I really enjoyed him. And when we are hurt by someone else's sin, we ultimately, we ask a lot of questions like, how could he do this? Like the man knows more about the Bible than I do, right? How could he fall in such a terrible way? And the answer is right here, folks. He did not abhor what was evil and he did not cling to what is good. And his sin has affected thousands. Not only just his church, who is absolutely reeling of losing their pastor. And as they ask these hard questions of what is next, is the next pastor gonna be just like this guy too? Can we not trust any preacher who comes up and says God's word is true? Your life matters in this church. And you must abhor what is evil and you must hold fast to what is good. Your sin will hurt us if it is not unchecked, if it is not unrepented, if it is not repented of. Paul continues his description of a, of a church family in verse 10. He says, love one another with brotherly affection. Okay, with this love that is like a family. And I really want you to understand what one another means here. Okay, we see that term a lot in scripture, but one another is not every person everywhere. Paul is writing this letter to who, okay? He's writing to a specific Roman church and one another is all of those Christians within that church. So we are commanded here as well. Every local church should love each other like they are family with brotherly affection. It is the true mark of genuine love to love someone even when they are not lovely. And that's easy and maybe excusable for us to do when it's our family. Like they're, they're family, you, you have to put up with them. Like when you get in an argument with a family member, do you just immediately excommunicate them? No, they're related to you. You gotta deal with the problem. You can't just sit in that silence, sit in that awkwardness of unconfessed, undealt with sin. So the real test of genuine love is can you love when somebody is unlovely to you? Can you love when somebody does not deserve it, when they have treated you in an unlovely way? Because genuine love, that is family love, does not run away in the face of hardship, does not run away in the sense, in the face of offense, but it buries its roots down and says, let's fix this. Okay, we cannot keep this in between us. We have to deal with this problem. That is genuine love that loves like family. And, and I want to impress upon you just how strong this is in scripture because we are not Paul's original audience. This is not a letter to Keystone Bible Church. This is a letter to a specific church in Rome. And this church in Rome is a pretty young church. Paul's excited to go there. He wants to preach the gospel in Spain. He wants to stop by Rome. But what we have here is a young church of both Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians. And those are people who for millennia before have butted heads. And now they're together in the same church. Like these Jewish Christians have this beautiful history of a millennia of being God's people, of being blessed, of having the law, of having the tabernacle and all these sacrifices and all these awesome traditions. And these like pagans over here are still like eating meat, sacrificed to idols. They're not even circumcised. There are all these cultural clashes in this church. These people should not get along. It is not a mono-ethnic. These people are all in the same social class, financial class. They're all just kind of already getting along. That is not at all the picture. And if you're kind of struggling to get it, let me illustrate it this way, okay? I want you to imagine an interracial church, let's say like literally perfectly like 50% Caucasian and 50% African-American, okay? That church in the 1960s in Alabama <laughs> with all the segregation and racial riots, How's that church gonna go? Is there gonna be some tension? Is there gonna be some strife there? Because naturally these people would separate and worship in two completely different churches, but God has placed them together in one body. Does that really give perspective to our petty little squabbles? <laughs> these people are working in serious ways to seek to live together. And honestly, let's just think on that. Like how could that type of church in 1960s Alabama, how could they worship together? Isn't that too much? Like, isn't Paul a little too obsessive here? And guys, the reason that Paul can expect this is because he just spent 11 chapters on the gospel and how the gospel unifies us. The gospel changes us. So an uncommon community understands rightly the gospel 
And the gospel is, I have deeply offended, I have deeply rebelled against God, and he loves so me so much that he has forgiven me of all my sin. And that's not like, cool, thanks Jesus, appreciate you, see you in heaven someday. No, that is a, thank you, Lord, that is how I'm going to live now. I'm going to model that same love, that same service, that same sacrifice. That's how I'm going to live, no matter how weird the rest of these people are. I am fully committed to living in community for God's glory. Meditating on what Jesus did for me on the cross spurs me to live my life entirely for him. And that is how a community can live together despite the fact that we are all sinners, despite that we are all not only sinful, but just humanly weak in a lot of different areas. In a common community, people can come and go based on their convenience. Oh, sorry, I couldn't make class today. Oh, this popped up. Oh, this popped up. Okay, you can come and go, and if someone gets offended, they just leave. If something happens that they don't like, there are plenty of other churches to go to. There are plenty of other CrossFits, Boy Scout clubs. You can just find something else to consume for your enjoyment. That is not an uncommon community. Not at all. An uncommon community glorifies God through a diverse and sinful group of people committing to love each other. They step into the house, and they close the door behind them, committing that if there is offense, if there are things we have to work through, we're going to work through them. We're not just going to leave when we are offended. Because brothers and sisters, how does God get the glory if you get hurt and then you leave and you go to another church that you like better? How is God glorified in that? Because God is glorified when two sinful people come together and reconcile their differences and continue to live in community. Because that's what the gospel does. The gospel unites us together despite our issues, despite our sin, despite our offenses against each other. Only God can keep a rebellious, sinful people living together and not just living together, tolerating it, but living together on mission for his glory. That is the power of the gospel. The gospel binds us together like a family and we live on mission together through him despite our struggles, despite our problems. We are all going to stand back up, deal with our problems, and get back to our post of serving God for his glory. So that's our third characteristic this morning, that uncommon community. We love each other like family. And this has hopefully been a very encouraging talk. You're really inspired right now that you want to live in uncommon community. But if you want to commit to uncommon community like you'd commit to a New Year's resolution, then there's about 90% chance that you're going to lose it in 26 days. So the fourth and final characteristic that is incredibly vital in our uncommon community is that we keep our passion. We don't just go up and down and have a mountaintop experience and then a really low valley. That we keep our passion for this community. We don't take a break from our post on our battleship, but that we keep on going, relying on our brothers and sisters to pick us up when we fall. Look at verse 11. Do not be slothful or lazy in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek and show, seek to show hospitality. The revered preacher Jonathan Edwards said this, those who have come to Christ have been born again and given a spirit of zeal to pursue the things of God with a sense of urgency and with hunger and passion. We are to be a church full of zeal, not a lazy church, but a zealous church for God's mission. And if we are not slothful in our zeal, we're not lazy. What's the opposite of that in verse 12? Okay, what are we, or excuse me, verse 11, what is coming next? We are fervent in spirit. Literally means we are set on fire by the spirit. And the outflow of that is gonna follow to the next command. So we're gonna serve the Lord. If we keep our passion, if we are not lazy, we are on fire for God and we go hard for his glory. I hope you're seeing how these are connecting. These aren't just random shotgun blasts. So verse 12 gives us three admonitions that help us keep that passion because it's all great when life is going great. But what happens when you do face trials? What happens when you do struggle? What should we go to? What should we turn to? Verse 12, we should rejoice in hope. Because brothers and sisters, we're not going to be here long. <laughs> Maybe it's today Jesus is coming back. That would be great. Okay, so we are rejoicing in hope. But we're also being patient 
and tribulation. We are enduring these times of suffering and hardship. These three of hope, endurance, and prayer are very natural partners to keep our passion high. That we keep our view of rejoicing that the hope of Jesus is coming soon. We stay enduring during trials. We do not let them bump us off our task. And we say constant and unceasing prayer. That is how we keep our passion. And really, as we talk about this idea of keeping our passion, I just, my mind goes to Samwise Gamgee. Okay, if you're a friend uh, or consumer of the Lord of the Rings, okay, Samwise Gamgee will not let Frodo quit. He will not let him stop. He will not let him give in. Even if he has to carry him to Mount Doom, he will accomplish the mission. So when his friend is weak, he picks him up. I love this quote from the two towers, right? Sam's trying to encourage Frodo and he says, and sometimes you don't want to know the end because how could the end be happy? But in the end, it's only a passing thing, this shadow. Every darkness must pass. A new day will come. And when the sun shines, it will shine out all the clearer. J.R.R. Tolkien, or Tolkien, depending on how you like to pronounce that, is very much saturated the Lord of the Rings with gospel imagery, and it's on display there. That the darkness will not last, so Sam chooses to cling to hope, to be enduring despite the great trial that they have faced together. And they keep the passion. So we are all responsible together for one another to keep our passion high for the mission. We are going to go hard for God's glory because we are temporarily here on assignment. This world is not our home. So we stay busy with keeping on the mission. We stay busy watching out for our brothers and sisters who are on the mission with us. And if they need help, what do we do? Look at verse 13, right? And they are in need. What do we do? We contribute to the needs of the saints. We seek to show hospitality, we support our brothers and sisters as they need it because we are not all going to experience the same thing at the same time. As God gives and takes away, we give and take away in order that all of us continue on mission for God's glory. During my study, I really enjoyed this definition of, of hospitality. It comes from John Corson. And it says, hospitality, it means to be a hospital for the hurting, lonely people who come your way. I'm going to repeat that. Hospitality is being a hospital for the hurting, lonely people who come your way. John continues with this. Hospitality is totally different than entertaining. Entertaining says, I want to impress you with my home, my decorating, my cooking, and so forth. But hospitality says, this house is a gift from the master. Use it however you'd like. Entertaining needs to impress. Hospitality needs to serve. Entertaining puts things before people saying, as soon as I get the house clean, I'll start having people over. Hospitality puts people first saying, no furniture, no problem. Let's eat on the floor. Entertaining subtly declares, this house is mine. It is an expression of my personality and my ingenuity. Hospitality whispers, what's mine is yours. Enjoy it anytime. We are responsible with what God has given us to use to keep all of us together passionately on mission. And that is genuine love. That's loving like family. That's using our gifts and not preferring our, our comfort, but that is serving. Because of our sinful flesh, we are sinfully weak, so we can lose our passion. If I had you raise your hand, I'm sure some of you would kind of raise your hand tonight if I asked, how's your passion doing? Who's losing their passion? I'm sure we'd have some people raise their hands. And there's other of you who are, you're not losing the passion at all. Like you're as ready as you've ever been. That's why we're all here because we cannot do this by ourselves. We need an uncommon community that is fully responsible to one another. So how are you guys doing? Okay. These four characteristics, are they fully on display in your life? Okay, if you, if you want to judge yourself by belonging together with us, how are the four rhythms of our life doing? Are you even doing life with us? And actually, some of you need to even farther back up, okay? Are you actually even a believer, right? Have you repented of your sin and placed your faith in Christ? That is absolutely step one. You need to actually enter into the uncommon community. 
Some of you, that's your step. For others of you, you need to assess, am I overvaluing or undervaluing my role? And is there some sort of pride that is keeping me from serving like I should? Is there something in my life that is not allowing me to be fully belonging to this community? Am I fully relying on this community without them relying on me? Or flip that, okay, are they fully relying on me, but I'm not really relying on them? We must stay faithful to God's word. Do you have a genuine love for this church family? I have seen way too many believers in my short stint in ministry who have spent their entire life in church, but they don't have a single relationship where someone can ask them how their marriage is doing. They don't have a single friend who asks them about their Bible reading. That cannot happen in a truly uncommon community. So there's this, this, this picture that if we truly are all together God-centered, then we are an uncommon community. But like almost everything in the Christian life, it's like you have it, but we keep going. Just like Jesus is already reigning, but not yet fully. So it takes all of us continually holding on to everything that God has commanded us in scripture and allowing our brothers and sisters to kind of push us when we need it, to pick us up when we need it, to slap us in the face if we need it. And we are fully expectant for them to do their part as we do our part. So we prioritize relationships within our local church family. What needs to change in your life? What sin do you need to kill so that we can fully be on mission for God because the local church is God's chosen vessel for his glory on this earth? And may we be found faithful, each of us, when he comes. Saying that Keystone Bible Church is truly a lighthouse of all members belonging to one another, manning our post as we fulfill God's mission that he's given us. Let's pray. God, your word is hard. It tells us to do uncomfortable things. And if we are reliant on ourselves, then we find all sorts of excuses, all sorts of things that get in the way, things that take our time, things that will frankly just push you out of our life because our priorities are wrong. God, may our lives truly be a living sacrifice. And as we live completely sacrifice of our own will, saying yes to you and everything. It just naturally flows. Like Paul wrote for us in Romans 12. So God, get rid of any distractions. If there are those who need to repent and maybe even deal with an offense that they have left undealt with with a brother or sister in this room, God, strengthen them to do that. It is worth it to live fully on mission for you And God, thank you for limiting us. Thank you for giving us our church family that we must rely on. I pray that you would strengthen each and every one of my brothers and sisters here to live fully on mission for you, to prioritize this gospel outpost until you call us home. And God, we give you the glory for what your word accomplishes, knowing that it's not in our strength, it's not in our power, but it's by your spirit. So we give it all to you, Lord. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for making us your children. May we be found faithful. And you hear me pray.